Hey there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship um, with a bonus video um, for the Test Driven Development in Java series, which is going to be all about refactoring to property based tests. Now, probably the easiest way for me to explain what I mean by a property based test would be to demonstrate. So I'm going to illustrate with an example here um, for some tests I've got for a a square root algorithm, there's the uh, the implementation of the algorithm using the, the Babylonian method, an iterative method for calculating square roots. And I did some test driven development to create that algorithm. And um, these are the tests that I used. There are six of them. Square root of zero is zero, square root of one is one, square root of four is two, square root of nine is three, square root of 16 is four, and square root of 0.25 is 0.5. Now, when we do TDD, if we're in the habit of only writing code to pass tests, we tend to end up, particularly if we take little small steps with each test, we tend to end up with a pretty high level of test assurance. And 90% of the time, 95% of the time, that's enough. That's more than enough. That gives us pretty reliable code for most applications. But sometimes we have code that is what's sometimes referred to as load-bearing code. It's that critical code that is either part of a, a critical feature that must not fail, because it would be a big deal if it did, or it's code that is very heavily reused and therefore if it did fail, the impact would be wide throughout our system. And therefore, for those reasons, we might decide that these these six unit tests here are not quite giving me the, the warm, fuzzy feeling I would want to feel to have confidence in this. So let's imagine my square root um, function there is being used in a flight control system. And now all of a sudden I think these six tests are completely inadequate. I want to do more tests. Um, now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be refactoring these tests into a single, what we call a property-based test. And we're going to do this in two steps, addressing two problems as we go. The first problem I'm going to address is that there is some obvious duplication in my test code. These individual test methods are all different examples of the same behavior. So although you may have heard people say that you shouldn't remove duplication from test code, this is not true. You do pay real attention to the, the readability of your tests. That's absolutely true. But in actual fact, when you see opportunities like this, where we've got different examples of the same rule, um, it's a perfect opportunity to remove that duplication using what's called a parameterized test. And a parameterized test is just a test method that accepts parameters for the test data. So our test here, for example, would accept parameters for the number and the square root that we're expecting. So I'm going to refactor this code and I'm going to do it. There is functionality built into JUnit4, which is what I've used here for doing parameterized tests, but I find it a little bit shonky, a little bit awkward, a bit clunky. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use a third party library that simplifies um, doing parameterized tests for JUnit4 and that's called JUnit Param. So what I'm going to do, I'll bring up my settings here, let's go on libraries and we're going to uh, add from Maven. So pl.pragmatists is the people who created this. Pragmatist, I don't think that's what I meant. And it's called JUnit Params. And the version I'm interested in is 1.0.4. That works with my version of JUnit. You might be asking, well, why aren't you using JUnit 5? It's got better support for parameterized testing. This is a separate video. I'm probably going to do a, a video diary on this, but um, I'm... I, I've learned from, from many years experience when it comes to like new versions of libraries and frameworks and tools to hang back two or three years. Because what we find with JUnit, for example, is there are a lot of tools that are built to work with it. And it takes time for that ecosystem of tools to catch up with the new version. So what I've been finding, and until quite recently, in fact, is that when people use JUnit 5, some of the other tools that we use with it don't work with JUnit 5. So I'm still hanging back. I'm sure by the end of this year, I'll be on JUnit 5 with the rest of you. But for now, I'm on JUnit 4. There we go. So we've got JUnit params added to our references there. 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to do this in one step because it's going to break my test. So first of all, we need a special test runner. So let's use that, the JUnit params runner. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to adorn here with an annotation called parameters. Be careful to use the one from JUnit params. There we go. And a simple way to provide test cases as as, com as as a list of common delimited strings, an array of common delimited strings, where each value inside the string separated by commas represents one of the parameters of this test method. So let's just do the first test to begin with, 0, 0. That's supposed to be a string, JSON. There we go. And then we have to have matching parameters of the right type and in the right order to match our common delimited string. So there's our input number, and there's our expected root. And then we're going to replace these literal values in our test with these parameter values so that we can reuse this for as many test cases as we like. Now, when I run this, hopefully it'll pick up the fact that this is a parameterized test. It'll feed in those data values inside the comma delimited string. As we'll see later, there are other ways of providing test data for JUnit params. And there we go, we've got our first parameterized test, square root test, root of. Yeah, so the name of the test is going to be a bit misleading if we're actually going to cover multiple cases with this. So I'm just going to generalize this, root of. There we go. Let's run that. So we make some effort to make sure that when our tests run, the names of the tests are helpful, root of, zero, zero. Okay, lovely. Right, and now we can very, very easily... So our first common delimited string, so let's add another one. Now it's very, very easy to add new test cases, so let's do a bunch of them. So we did one and one, we did four and two, we did nine and three, we did 16 and four. So these are the exact same test cases. I'm not inventing any new tests here. And the square root of 0.25 is 0.5. Let's just run those, and we should have in our parameterized test six individual test cases. Hopefully, all of them passing. Let's take a look. There we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Lovely. Right. That means that we can get rid of these duplicated tests. Remember, these are not tests for a different rule or a different behavior, they're just different examples of the same rule or the same behavior. So I think it's fair to only have one test. I'm a big fan of having one test per behavior. There we go. There's our parameterized test. Now that we've done that, not only have we removed the duplication, but it becomes very, very easy now to add new test cases. We don't need to keep writing more test methods. We can just add another test case. It's as simple as that. There we go. Now... These seven tests are still not giving me that warm, fuzzy feeling. I think maybe I need to test more extensively than that. How about all the numbers from 0 to 99, for example? Now, I could sit here and type them all out, but um, hmm, I'm not sure I want to do that. That's going to take a long time. There might be a smarter way of doing this. And indeed, with JUnit params, there is. We can create a helper method here that returns an object array, which is going to represent our test cases. And I can follow the naming convention, parameters for, followed by the name of the test method these are the parameters for. Okay, and what I'm going to do, just to begin with, just to get it working, is um, let's return 0 and 0. So this is... a two-dimensional object array there we go and that just represents that's just to get it going that just represents our first test case there and let's get rid of all of these because we're not going to be using those anymore so we should end up with one parameterized test with one test case for zero and zero there we go now we don't have to hard code these now we can actually generate them so what i'm going to do is i'm going to do um if we use an int stream, we're going to use the range method. Let's go from 0 to 100 exclusively. So this will generate 100 from 0 to 99. Let's map that to an object. There's our number n. 
and what we're going to do is we're just going to have an array of those objects. There we go. So this will represent all of our test cases from 0 to 99. Let's just run that. Now, problem, the root bit here. We don't know what the root of all these numbers are because when we're generating our test data, we're going to have to somehow survive without root. And this is where the property-based part comes in. We can't just say, well, the answer is supposed to be this because we don't know what the answer is. We might have to calculate an answer or do it in a more general algorithmic way. So what we could do, instead of saying, well, the square root of 9 is 3 or the square root of 4 is 2, is we could, we could assert some property of all square roots. For example, that's our number. If we were to multiply the square root by itself, we should end up with the original number. Yes, a square root squared is equal to the original number. And that's true for any number that is a positive rational number, any number that is a positive number. Um, so this should be true for all numbers. Let's take a look and see whether it is. Interesting. Half of them are failing, half of them are passing. What's going on here? So we can see that our answers here, let's just highlight that, are very, very close. So there's a floating point problem here. What are we going to do about this? The problem with floating point is we can't really necessarily make it more accurate without going to a lot of effort. Well, we could go back and talk to the customer, um, the, air, the, the, the company that's making the, the airplane that this flight control system is going to work on, and we could say, how accurate do these square roots need to be? How many decimal places? And they come back and they say, well, it needs to be at um, 12, 12 decimal places. Um, so what we could do in J unit in our assert equals, we could actually specify a delta, a margin for error, if you like. So rather than having it be zero, we can make it 12 decimal places, 10 to the minus 12. Let's run the tests now. And they're all passing. They're all accurate to 12 decimal places. So I'm happy with this, they're all working. So this is what we call a property-based test. It is a test that asserts a general property of the result so that we can have confidence that the result is correct. For example, the square of a square root should be equal to the original number. So I've reversed the computation here to check whether it's actually correct. And you can imagine other ways of doing it. I could, for example, have written used an alternative algorithm for calculating square roots compared one with the other. The chances of both different algorithms coming up with exactly the same wrong answers um, are vanishingly remote. So there are all sorts of ways that we can assert general properties about the results, about the behaviour of our code, so that we can then generate as many test cases as we think we need to satisfy ourselves that our code really works, that it's reliable enough, as it is in this case. Now, if 100 test cases wasn't enough, how much extra code would I need to write to add 900 more tests? So we've got 1,000 tests. Well, it's just one character. And this is the power of this kind of testing, of generative testing. If we're generating the test inputs then with very little extra code, we can buy ourselves enormous amounts of assurance. Off it goes. It's going to take a little while here. Now, obviously, there's going to be a little bit of performance engineering involved as well, but there are all sorts of things we can do about that. And also, we're not going to do this for all of our code. We're only going to do it for that critical load-bearing code, that 5 or 10% that really, really needs to be very reliable, which means we'd only be changing that code 5 or 10% of the time so we'd only be running these tests 5 or 10% of the time. And if you're smart about it and package your property-based tests separately um, to, your, um, to your other fast-running tests, then it's often not a problem. And of course, if they do run slow, there are things we can do with Janie. We can stick this on the cloud and parallelize it and so on and so forth. So we can throw some hardware at this as well. Okay, so there we go. Let's take it back to 100 just so it runs fast. Now, that's, that's a range, just to demonstrate one last thing. We could also very easily 
do it with random numbers between 1 and 100. Once we're in here, see how easy it is. Very little heavy lifting involved at all. Very little heavy lifting involved at all to do quite mind-boggling amounts of testing. We've, look how little test code there is. There's a lot less than there was. Um, so with just a few lines of test code, we've got 100 tests. And we're getting pretty good coverage. And you can imagine the kinds of things we can generate here programmatically. So ranges, random numbers, combinations and permutations, random strings and all kinds of you know string patterns and all sorts of things that we can do programmatically that would allow us to explore the state space of our application in ways that automated testing doesn't. Automated testing only runs the tests we thought of. So this is kind of automated exploratory testing if you think about it, um, but without the donkey work and with, um, with the ability to cover uh, mind-boggling amounts of state space. I've been working with a client, for example, out in the States who are working on, um, who, whose end client um, is attached to space exploration and they're working on a system there where they've got a Java system that's about half a million lines of code. And we've been taking their JUnit tests and we're parameterizing and property basedizing, if that's a word, some of those tests. And they now have a test suite that runs overnight that has over two and a half billion test cases. Two and a half billion tests. If you ever come even close to that. So a lot can be done with these. I'm a big fan of them. Um, and what I like most about this is I'm using tools that I use every day just to do TDD. And you can do exactly the same thing using the tools every day that you use. You don't have to go out and learn Z or VDM or one of these formal specification languages. You don't have to use learn how to use model checking tools and all this wonderful stuff necessarily. You can just take a unit testing framework and with a little bit of ingenuity, you can buy yourself quite massive amounts of test coverage very cheaply. So there you go. That's how you refactor from unit tests to property-based tests. I hope that's given you a little bit of inspiration and some ideas. Go back and look at your code. Go back and look at your tests. Could some of them be turned into parameterized tests? Get rid of that duplication. Could some of those parameterized tests be turned into property-based tests for critical code? Do you know which parts of your code are critical? There's a big question. So lots to think about, hopefully. Um, there you go.